The bedding in this system is therefore a compost barn where it is turned daily with a subsoiler. I believe this to be a much more comfortable system for animals during the dry period, providing them with better conditions. This bucket then, which we made to apply sand. I took a trip to Canada in 2017, and I saw this equipment there, which producers were using. Later, when I got back to Brazil, I approached a young man at a metalworking shop and said I wanted a piece of equipment, just like that. In this position, there is no location where wind or rain enters. Therefore, we can leave it open because no rain gets in from that direction. And our main objective is for them to consume the greatest possible quantity of ration. So, when they reach 1.5% of consumption, weaning is carried out. Jesse sent a message saying that he won't be making videos anymore because you haven't subscribed to the Santa Fe channel. So subscribe now and he will continue recording on farms around the world. In the compost barn, we have prepartum cows grouped in mixed batches with nulliparous and multiparous individuals housed together, as well as dry cows located on the other side. Each time we dry off cows, they remain there for the entire dry period, after which they are moved to the prepartum group. Among the dry cows are also pregnant heifers from the fifth month of gestation onward, who are transferred here to better acclimate them to the environment and to participate in the cooling system. The same cooling measures applied during free stall hours and to lactating cows are also implemented here for the dry animals. During the prepartum period, cows remain in this area for 21 to 25 days, 21 days for nulliparous, and 25 days for multiparous individuals. They are continually provided with chopped wheat straw and receive an anionic diet with regular urine pH monitoring to assess diet efficacy. During the dry period, the diet primarily consists of wheat silage, soybean meal, and minerals, and vitamin E supplementation is provided to ensure an intake of 1,000 international units per day for all animals during the dry period. This guarantees high quality nutrition, preventing excessive loss or gain of body condition score during the dry period, so that animals reach the prepartum phase consuming adequate feed, which in turn ensures that they continue to eat well postpartum and do not encounter ketosis or other metabolic problems. The bedding in this system is therefore a compost barn where it is turned daily with a subsoiler. I believe this to be a much more comfortable system for animals during the dry period, providing them with better conditions, and also for the prepartum period, offering more space at calving time. We do not have individual calving pens, and as a consequence, we have a minor issue with cryptosporidium. To prevent this problem in the Bezerra, we use halofuginone as a preventive measure. Otherwise, everything is very well managed. We have no issues with metritis. Only rarely do we encounter cases of retained placenta. However, as the animal's immunization is excellent, they recover smoothly, and we do not observe many other problems such as abomasol displacement. The incidence is very low about one case per year at most. When it does occur, it is typically due to a management or dietary error, which can easily be overlooked during the dry or prepartum period if feed intake is not adequately ensured. Using silage from different silo locations or making a mistake during feed distribution can lead to intake variation, dietary inconsistencies, and consequently, postpartum metabolic problems. However, these aspects are generally well controlled during the dry and prepartum periods and operations have proceeded smoothly. In the sprinkler system, both in the holding pen and along the alleys, we have an automatic cycle in which ventilation is activated for four minutes, followed by sprinkling for 30 seconds. Regarding the milking routine, we use a foam pre-dipping containing lactic acid. Subsequently, we implement a double pre-dipping. First, we apply the foam, then we perform forest stripping with three streams into a black bottom strip cup. After this, the foam is dried with a paper towel and the teat cup clusters are attached. After the cluster is released by the automatic detacher, we carry out individual post-milking teat disinfection. We have observed a significant improvement in somatic cell count, SCC, currently at 130,000 cells per milliliter. In 2016, the SCC was approximately 600,000 cells per milliliter, and each year, we have been able to further reduce these values. 
In terms of mastitis types and incidence, we currently maintain an incidence of less than 1%. Our main challenge is specifically Escherichia coli. There are no longer issues related to contagious mastitis. Cases are exclusively environmental in origin. Currently, we do not use vaccination against Escherichia coli, relying solely on therapeutic treatments following identification. As to the reason for using, or not using, immunization strategies, in the past, we did test a type of vaccine, but the severity of cases did not change significantly. Nowadays, the adopted protocol consists of immediate antibiotic treatment upon mastitis identification, even though recommendations often suggest supportive therapy alone. This approach has resulted in much faster recovery. With supportive therapy alone, the cow usually takes nearly a week to recover, whereas with immediate intervention at the first symptoms of environmental mastitis involving the administration of oxytocin, intramammary injectable antibiotics, along with supportive therapy, we observe that within three days the animal is able to return to its previous production level. Here we replace the bedding once a week. At present, the cost is between two reais and two reais and 40 centavos per cow per day, corresponding to approximately 15 to 20 kilograms of sand per day. The management consists of removing the driest portion of sand to the back and moving the wettest to the front, thereby reducing contamination. This barn originally had 50 stalls with flooring and rubber mattresses. Over time, we observed a high incidence of hawk injuries which led us to remove the mattresses and switch to sand bedding. This change alone resulted in an additional calf per cow. Because sand contains no organic matter, it reduces the proliferation of diseases. The barn currently measures 31 meters by 37 meters. Stall size in lot one, primiparous cows, is 1.15 meters by 1.80 meters, and in lot two, multiparous cows. It is 1.20 meters by 1.20 meters, 1.80 meters. Before the adoption of sand bedding, our SCC ranged from 600,000 to 700,000 cells per milliliter. Today, it is around 200,000, and cow welfare has also improved. On hotter days, cows now lie down more often, unlike before, when the heat retention of the rubber mattress deterred them from lying down. Furthermore, the fine sawdust used previously was easily blown away by the fans, discouraging resting behavior. If the cost of sawdust at that time were equivalent to today's prices, it would likely have reached approximately one reel per cow per day, including lime. We developed a scoop specifically designed for distributing sand. During a trip to Canada in 2017, I observed this type of equipment being used on local farms. Upon my return to Brazil, I approached a metal worker and described the device and its intended function as handling sand is labor intensive and impractical with conventional scoops and shovels. Drawing upon what I had seen, I provided a model. And since 2019, that piece of equipment has been in operation here, greatly facilitating our work. Here, we are in part of the facility that used to be the milking parlor, a herringbone layout, previously housing the milk cooler. This was also the original stable where lactating cows were kept for feeding. This area was utilized for approximately 20 years and marked the beginning of larger scale milk production on the farm. As of 2013, we housed up to 45 animals in this location. New free stall facilities were built in 2015, along with the milking parlor, and since then, investments have continued annually. The former silage silos are still standing. Currently, these structures are used for raising replacement heifers from eight to 11 months of age. After this, the heifers are transferred to other facilities where they remain from 12 months until they join the dry cow group and parturition. As previously unmentioned, insemination is performed from 400 days of age, with the aim of achieving first calving at approximately 23 to 24 months. We have successfully maintained an average calving age of 24 months.
Here in the calf facility, when cows in the prepartum area give birth, we bring the heifers here. The first protocol we use is umbilical disinfection with iodine. We perform this procedure there and, subsequently, repeat it here. Drying powder, specifically lime, which is used to dry the animals, is applied. And we also use the heat lamp to warm the environment. This facility was formerly a pigsty, and we renovated it to accommodate the heifers. Previously, the area housed 10 pigs with slatted flooring, so we installed a partition in the middle, allowing each heifer to remain in its own individual pen. Even so, they have a drier space due to the slatted floor, which offers the advantage of underfloor ventilation without direct exposure. Therefore, our incidence of pneumonia is practically zero. We do not lose heifers, nor do we encounter problems with pneumonia. Diarrhea is well controlled. Our main challenge was cryptosporidium, which we managed to control with locher, and flies are something we have effectively managed using mosquito screens. We installed screening around the entire perimeter, and, as a result, we no longer have the fly issues during summer that were prevalent in previous years. The heifers remain here from birth, and we provide colostrum within the first hours of life. When they do not voluntarily ingest it, we utilize an esophageal tube to ensure they consume 10% of their body weight in colostrum. They receive milk replacer until 60 days of age, or until they are able to consume 1.5% of their body weight in concentrate. Here, they have ad libitum access to water in buckets and to pelleted concentrate. Our main objective is to maximize concentrate intake. Thus, weaning is carried out once they reach the 1.5% intake threshold, after which they proceed to the next production stages. Up to three months of age and they continue receiving pelleted concentrate. Thereafter, they transition to a meal form, protein-enriched concentrate with wheat silage and they remain on this diet until they join the insemination category. At this stage, they stop receiving the protein meal and are provided with a mineral supplement with mycotoxin binder and soybean meal. These components are mixed in a total mixed ration, TMR, with wheat silage and a small portion of corn silage, depending on the characteristics of each silage. In this way, we balance the diet according to the specific requirements of each category and ensure suitability for each animal. Dehorning is performed using a gas-heated hot iron. We began using this method a month and a half ago and have observed very satisfactory results. The animals appear calmer and more comfortable as a sedative and local anesthetic are used. Consequently, this procedure is much more sustainable and significantly less painful for the animals compared to the previous method, which involved using paste to wear down the horns. The feed preparation area contains cottonseed, conventional soybean meal, a blend of canola and extruded products, a mix of maize with other additives, and a mineral supplement. In the background, wheat straw can be seen. A distinguishing feature of this area is its positioning, which prevents wind and rain from entering. Therefore, it is possible to leave the area open, as no rain enters from that direction. This greatly facilitates handling, eliminating the need to open doors, and also allows sufficient headroom for tipper trucks to unload materials more easily. In the silage area, we currently operate with only one concreted silo. Over the years, and possibly this year, we plan to concrete two additional silos. All silos already have concrete floors, but I refer here specifically to concreting the walls as well to facilitate management. This year, we succeeded in producing better quality silage, which consequently resulted in improved productivity. We use plastic sheeting on the sides, an oxygen barrier, and a surface sheet. The perimeter is sealed with gravel. We use a loader bucket to remove the silage and the staff are always instructed to remove the silage uniformly, even when using the loader bucket, to avoid excessive movement, the ingress of oxygen, and subsequent spoilage of the silage.